Hi, I'm Traveling Tom, and today we're going to take a look at the Union Pacific DD40X, the longest, heaviest, the most powerful diesel electric locomotive ever made. I'm here in North Platte, Nebraska at the Cody Railroad Museum. I've already talked to the personnel that work here. They gave me their permission to open up the doors and explain how everything works on this locomotive. I would like to thank all the people over the years that sent me messages, asked me questions, and all my subscribers on my YouTube channel. That's part of the reason why we're here. I uploaded a video of the DD40X many years ago and got tons of questions on it. And there were so many people that said, wouldn't it be nice if you could open up the door, show us the engine, explain how everything works. And that's why we're here. Before we start, I want to stress that this is not the most powerful locomotive of all time. There are many steam, electric, and turbine locomotives that are more powerful. But as far as diesel power, this is the most powerful diesel electric locomotive of all time, even today. Now if you're wondering who Traveling Tom is, I used to be a locomotive mechanic. I was a conductor for Union Pacific. I have uh, built passenger cars. I've overhauled passenger cars. There's not much I haven't done with these old trains. So let's get started and take the tour. So the way this locomotive works, it's an electric locomotive. It carries its own power plant, which is right here. It has two 16-cylinder diesel engines a power generator. Electricity comes down here through these thick cables into the electric motors over here. There's one of the engines. Cooling system over here. air compressor then the other engine air compressor cooling system water and oil pumps 16 cylinder diesel engine alternator generator so we'll start the tour with this room behind the cab here electricians call this a generator room mechanics call this the inertia air filter room or the clean air room when the engine is running it sucks air in through this air intake right here. There's another one on the other side. The air travels through these inertia air filters. There's two of them. There's one here, one over here. Now these inertia air filters, there's actually no air filters in them. They're just hollow. It's just a big hollow metal box with these louvers on there. So you see it's shaped like a bunch of V's the way this works, this filters out large particles of dirt. The theory is that uh, when air gets sucked in here, it comes in through this part here, and has to do a U-turn to get out these louvers. Say we're sucking up sand and pieces of dirt. The dirt being heavier, it's going to hit this metal bar right here, and then fall into this um, hollow box right here. From there, this large blower sucks all this debris out like a vacuum cleaner and it blows out a small square hole in the top of the roof. The air is then going to come into this air box through these filters, these final air filters, and into the turbo. And looking at these filters, you see they're pretty oily. This locomotive was probably smoking quite a bit right before they retired it. We change these filters out about once every three months. This large blower over here, this is what cools the traction motors. It forces air through a, a duct and down into the traction motors. And this enormous blower takes quite a bit of horsepower, I believe it's over 100. This large box over here, this is a filter for air coming into the 
uh, electrical cabinet. Looking at the back side of the main electrical cabinet. You now pretty much every wire in the locomotive ends up here, including the high voltage cables from the generator, which have been cut. And as you can tell, there is just thousands and thousands of wires in here. I mean, look at how thick this is. Just nothing but a bundle of wires. And as you can see, there's not a lot of color coding in here. Most of these wires are either gray or black. They got tags on there so that we know which wires are which. And God help you if uh, these tags start falling off. So it's very difficult to find a short circuit in here. That's one of the worst problems you can have with the locomotives, these electrical problems. And looking at the back of the control modules, which I'll explain later. This is an AR12 main generator. The generator produces electricity for the traction motors. You can see the cables coming out there. And someone left us these little notes. See how accurate they are. The AR12 main generator maximum voltage is 1450 DC. Maximum current is 4800 amps. It's 18,000 pounds or 9 tons, and he's right on the money there. Now, with a traditional engine and generator, if you want more generator output, you just simply increase the engine speed. But since um, with locomotives, when we're starting, the wheels tend to slip. If we had a lot of amperage going to the wheels, they would just keep spinning until we powered the engine down. And um, that would be pretty difficult, so instead they limit the amount of voltage coming in the generator. And the way this generator works is there's an alternator, which I'll explain later, that provides excitation in this generator. It sends electricity through these slip rings here. And this is what provides excitation to the generator. And that's going to determine how much uh, amperage is coming out of this generator. We have these windows to see if we blew a fuse on our diode. Every diode has a fuse in there. There's a, a rectifier here and a rectifier over there. So once the air enters here through these air filters, comes through this tube and into the intake of the turbocharger. From there, the turbocharger is going to compress the air. It's going to go through this port here, through this duct, and into the air box of the engine. This area right here, that we're looking at, from the bottom here to the top here, is the air box. Air comes through here under pressure, and when the piston comes down, the, the air comes through there, gives it fresh, clean air, comes out through the exhaust, and into the exhaust manifold. From there, the exhaust gases go back to the turbocharger and out through the stack. So looking at this cab, the cab is very large. I'm fairly certain you can fit about 20 people in here. It's based off the F45 design, the Cal unit, which is why we have this conductor side door here, which is not common at all in most locomotives. Most locomotives, we do not have this door here. And this is the first locomotive with a safety cab that didn't have the Cal design on it. You know, it has a traditional design on it. So this is the only locomotive I've ever seen with the handbrake in the cab. And I really hate these handbrakes. They're loud and you got to pull this up and click it about 25 times for the handbrake set. So probably not the best idea but I'm not sure where else they put that. Most of the handbrakes are in the nose and they're the wheel type. Here we got the, the flag and the flare kit. If there's ever an accident we'd uh, run out with that and put flares on the tracks and fusees and flags. So all the glass in this locomotive is bulletproof glass. 
very often you'll see spray painter right here full equipped FRA part 223 glazing that's what it means now some of you may wonder why we need bolt proof glass my obvious answer is uh, you know when you're going by someone's house at 3 o'clock in the morning blowing your horn that gets them pretty mad so we have been shot at several occasions we hit cars, we hit trucks, we hit people, we hit animals some of that flies up into the windshield sometimes we go on an underpass people have been known to throw in choppy carts at us cinder blocks uh, two by fours, pallets, you name it and all that stuff has to not come through the windshield and kill the conductor or the engineer so that's why we have it now this glass is uh, not indestructible and when I was overhauling locomotives I took a ball peen hammer to the glass in the door like this and you will eventually make a hole in it if you hit it enough times but it is um, very tough and it will save your life now this type of control stand was made up until 1974 after 1974 we had a, a lever for the throttle and we also had a lever for the dynamic brakes so the way this one worked is if you wanted to use a throttle whatever direction we'd move it in we'd use this and then this would be our throttle and then once we wanted to go back in the dynamic brake we'd have to put this back in the idle put this back in the neutral and then put this in the off position and then we go back whatever direction we're going in and go the other direction and then that gives us our dynamic braking now this reverse handle is made to be removed and this is a safety feature because you know if we're in the middle of nowhere if we're in the city and we're going to leave these locomotives alone we don't want somebody coming in here and putting this in the forward and then um, you know taking off with it so this was a safety feature you can take this reverse handle with us and now they can't do nothing with the locomotive now if we're in the yard where it's secure we'll just put it in this holder here if not we'll take it with us we'll put it in our bag uh, sometimes they have the basket in the office where you put the reverse handle so on the left hand of the control stand I've only seen this used on Denver or Grand Southern Pacific and Union Pacific locomotives so what this is for and a good example is that if we're doing hump yard duty we're constantly going to be moving this throttle in the idle and then whatever notch we're doing and it's a lot of work so let's just say notch 4 is too much power and notch 3 is not enough power what we could do is put this in the notch 4 and then we could reduce or increase the power and in that sense it would be like it's a notch 3.5 or notch 4.5 or whatever and that way our train goes at a nice steady pace and we don't need to keep moving this throttle back and forth so over here we have the speedometer, the horn, I definitely prefer this horn compared to the push button one. So in the middle of the night when we're passing houses, we just barely, you know, pull down on it and not make so much noise. This is a sand for the lead truck, and this used to be here, so I'm not sure why they moved it. And there, was, there used to be a light here. And then we have a sand, we push this for sand on all the locomotives, this is just for our locomotive. And this is for all locomotives. We have the bell valve here. This button attendant call, when we push it, it's going to ring bells on locomotives behind us. And that's going to get the guy's attention to tell him to come up here. This is to cut out the dynamic brakes. And this switch is to turn on these lights in the cab. There's one there, one up here. Headlight rear, turning the light on and off on the headlight on the rear. Headlight front, turns the light on in the front ground lights, that's those lights, the step lights and one of these is for a generator field what that does is it, it turns off the, the field on the generator and we would need to do something like that if, if we wanted to pump up the air on the train, if we wanted the air compressors to spin faster we would put that in the neutral and then uh, move the throttle to say notch 4 and that's going to increase RPM and turn the throttle faster but we don't want the generator to be putting power to anything so that's what the generator switch does and I'm, one of these is a fuel pump and uh, you know I can't see it because it's so wore out and one of them is for control headlight switch here medium bright and dim and uh, 
we always switch the light to dim when we're passing other locomotives and then you know when we're passing locomotives on the other side of the track so looking over here we have the alarm silencer button if we have a say for instance we have a hot engine there's going to be a bell that's ringing and behind that um, cabinet over there so we're going to push this button to shut off that bell we have these two dimmer switches these are going to dim the lights in there over there PCS open that stands for pneumatic control switch when we have an emergency brake application that lights going to come on wheel slip if our wheels are starting to slip we need to back off on the throttle brake warning when we're using too much dynamic brakes you know when this uh, needle starts going in like say the, over there in the 8 we need to back off on our dynamic brake the handbrake that's pretty neat I've only seen that used on this locomotive but if we have a, a handbrake that's set on any locomotive that lights gonna come on and then we need to go release that handbrake before we leave train control I've never seen before I'm not sure what that what that's related to looking up here these are amp meters we have two gauges because we have two generators this is showing us how many amps we're putting in one of our traction motors it's usually the number two traction motor and as you can see it's times a hundred so for instance this would be 900 amps 1000 amps 1200 amps and we know on this locomotive the amperage rating the maximum amperage rating for our traction motors is 1120 which is right about here now on future amp meters they would usually have this painted green and we could operate for as long as we want in the green then we'd have yellow about here if we were operating in the yellow we could only go for maybe 20 minutes then over here in the red we may have as little as five minutes where we can operate in the red and if we went if we were drawing too much uh, amperage in our traction motors we could uh, burn up our traction motors we could burn up the cables and then to the left this is for our dynamic braking when we go into dynamic braking showing us how many amps we're putting into the dynamic brake grid as you can see it goes uh, up to 800 amps we also have our heater switches here looking down below you don't see this too often this is called a dead man's pedal when you're going down the road you have to have your foot on this pedal at all times if you let your foot off this pedal then the engine would start to rev down now this wasn't a very good safety feature because obviously you just put your bag on it and uh, keep that pedal down but I, mean, I guess it was better than nothing now many of you are probably wondering what this is this is actually a, a light and a speaker this is known as in cab signals this is very old dating back to the steam engine days I believe they first started developing this in the 1920s and it's uh, pretty neat I've only seen it used on a few railroads uh, CSX Norfolk Southern CNW and Union Pacific Amtrak uses it what it does is that when we pass a signal whatever signal we pass it's going to show up in here like if we pass a green signal we'll see green if we pass a yellow signal it'll be yellow yellow or red and uh, I believe reds in there but this is great like if um, you know if you got bad weather or if um, maybe the conductor's not paying attention the engineer's not paying attention you pass a signal and you say did you see what that signal was and they say no you just look up here okay we we're, we pass the yellow signal now this is not going to tell you what the signal ahead of you is unfortunately but it will tell you what the signal is on the track you're on now there's a speaker in this box anytime we pass a signal other than green that speaker is going to make a sound and this lever we're going to need to acknowledge that we saw that signal so that's what that's for acknowledge and we'll move this lever back and then that alarm is going to go off if we were sleeping and we pass that signal that alarm is going to start to go off and if we don't move this lever it's going to put the train in emergency and stop us and over here we have CO which stands for cutout if we're you know not the whole Union Pacific system has these in cap signals it's only in certain locations so if we're you know going down the tracks where cap signal signals aren't used we're going to put that in the cutout this locomotive has two types of braking systems on it the automatic brake valve and the independent brake valve we have a switch here called a cutout switch if we're pulling freight cars 
we're going to have this in freight for pulling passenger cars we're going to have that in passenger when we do an air brake test we're going to make an application and then we're going to cut out the air brake system by moving this to out and then we're going to watch our gauges and see how much leakage we have if the leakage is acceptable we're going to put that back in the freight automatic brake valve has several positions in it to the far right is an emergency and I'm sure you all know what emergency brake does. This next position is called handle off. If this is a trailing locomotive, this is a position this handle is going to be in. And you can see that if I get it off, this handle could actually be physically removed. This is a safety feature. With the handle removed, a bunch of kids can't come in this train in the middle of the night and then release the brakes on our train, sending it down the hill. So we do that as a safety feature. This next position is quite a bit of confusion. It's called suppression. A suppression will give us a full brake application, but its main purpose has to deal with penalty brake applications. If I'm in a locomotive that has an alerter, and what an alerter does, it's on a timer. If I don't move the throttle, if I don't blow the horn, if I don't move the brakes, it's going to think I'm sleeping, and it's going to start beeping at me. And when it starts beeping, I'm going to have to push a button to reset that, and then the, the timer starts over again. If that starts beeping at me, and for whatever reason, I do not push that button, it will put the train in emergency. But putting the train in emergency could lead to a derailment. This is especially true if you have a bunch of loads behind some lightweight, say you got flat cars in the middle of the train. Those loads can uh, jackknife those flat cars, and we don't want to go in emergency in a tunnel, around a sharp curve or on bridges. So for whatever reason, we know this train's about to go in emergency, we're gonna move this handle in the suppression. Instead of the train going in emergency, it's just gonna give us a full brake application, and then that way, things will be you know, much more calmer. Now this, this zone, this is called the service zone. And if I just move the brake here, just like the brakes on your car, I'm just hardly putting any brakes on our train, the minimum application. If I move this handle all the way over here, that's a maximum application. We're putting the full force of the brakes on our train. And then of course, to the far left is release. In that position, the brakes are released. An independent brake is missing its handle, but the independent brake is for the locomotive brakes only. Like if we're working in the yard, this is just gonna put the brakes on the locomotive and nothing else. Or if we have trailing locomotives, we'll put the brakes on all the trailing locomotives. This has a feature on it where we push down on the handle and it will temporarily release the brakes on the locomotive. And if we let the handle back up, it will put the brakes back on the locomotive. This is called the bail off. On the side of the control stand we have this valve. As you can see, lead or dead. If we're the lead locomotive, this is we're going to be controlling the air brakes for the locomotives behind us. If this is like the second or third locomotive or in trail, we're going to move that to in trail. There used to be a knob here. This can regulates the air pressure going in the airline. So many people ask me if there's a toilet on the train, and yes there is. It's located in the nose here. All modern locomotives have a toilet, similar to this one. And as you can see, there's nothing special about it. Uh, the waste just drops in this tank, and then it goes down the tube and then it's pumped out whenever this train gets refueled. Now in my experience, uh, when we're moving, uh, the engineer is very reluctant to come down here. And you can imagine if you're going uh, 60 miles an hour, which is a mile a minute, the minute you come down here to, to pee, that's what, probably when you're going to hit something. So you usually do whatever you got to do before you leave. And if not, I've actually seen some engineers just step out the side there and pee right off on the side of the locomotive when you're going in the middle of nowhere. Not much else is in the cab. There's some air brake piping down there. Uh, the blower for the heater. You know, some miscellaneous wires. This large tank is full of sand. And we need sand for traction. There's another sand box over there. There's the sander valves they're light. Uh, we got a holder for the toilet paper and the paper towels. Got tools for disconnecting the air hose. We can lock the front door if we want to. 
miscellaneous air pipe hoses in case we break one. Next your cable for hooking up multiple locomotives. It looks like some kind of towing cable. And this box is uh, for, I believe, the. Let's open it up. In this box it says continuous train control system. I'm not exactly sure what that's for. Another blower for the heater. And that's about it, really. Now, these comfort cabs are great. There's only one problem. And that is we cannot see the guy in front of us giving us hand signals. So you can imagine if you're an engineer, you want to use hand signals. You gotta keep sticking your head out the window. It's kind of a problem if it's raining all the time or snowing. You know, you have to use radio. So you won't see these comfort cabs used very often for switching in yards. They're almost always a traditional type. So I want to talk a minute about, about this emergency brake valve. This is a fail-safe valve, and this is extremely loud. You only want to pull this handle once to see what it's like, because it just about blows out your eardrums. Now there's a reason this emergency brake valve is here and not over by the engineer stand, even though he has one in his automatic brake valve. And I'm going to share a story with you. I was on the road with a very long train. It was almost two miles long. We came over this steep hill, and we started going down the hill. Now normally the signal was always green, but this time it was different. The signal was a flashing yellow, and the engineer wasn't expecting it, and neither was any of us. And I could tell the engineer was having a hard time getting this train under control. We would start, you put in the hard dynamic, you put a brake application on, but it seems like we were getting a lot of slack action with this long train. It kept shoving us like we'd be doing 30. The slack action would come in and then push us back up to 40. So by the time we got to that solid yellow, which means no more than 30, we were already going past 30 miles an hour. I think we were doing about 35. So now the conductor is saying, you know, you got this train under control. The engineer is saying, yeah, I got it. But as we start getting closer and closer to that red signal, we're still doing about, I'd say 20 miles an hour, a quarter mile away. So at this point, the conductor was saying, I think we need to put this train in emergency. And the engineer was saying, no, I got it, I got it. Now putting the train in emergency is pretty serious, but running the red signal is very serious and that'll get you fired and you could get people killed. So after some time passed, the conductor, after some arguing, he just went over here and grabbed that emergency brake handle and put the train in emergency. You know, he didn't care what the engineer said because the conductor is the person that's in charge of the train. And we stopped about 20 feet from that red signal, so it's good he did because I don't think that engineer could have got it stopped in time. But that's just one example why we have this emergency brake valve here. It's to avoid conflicts with the engineer. We don't want them getting into fist fights over you know, how to control the train because it is a conductor that's in charge of the train. So looking back at the high voltage electrical cabinet, you can see some, someone spray painted the locomotive weight, total weight 542,780 pounds. Now when I was overhauling locomotives, they wanted these removed. They claimed since this wasn't painted, we could actually get a shock if it, you know, there's a short circuit that we get shocked through these little, um, you know, these little plaques here. So we had to remove all those and replace them with stickers. Over here we have lights and switches. Since we have two engines, we have two sets of lights. These are mostly warning lights. So these warning lights over here, hot oil, low oil, crankcase pressure, low water, any of those will shut down our engine. Hot engine, if our engine gets to 208 degrees or just before boiling, this light's gonna come on. No power is usually really the traction motor problem or if we blow in a generator fuse. Turbo auxiliary pump, before we start the engine, there's an oil pump that's going to come on. It's going to oil the turbo bearings. And after we shut the engine down, it's going to keep pumping oil to the bearings for about 35 minutes to cool it. Load test, I'm not going to get too much into that, but we could put an artificial load on the engine to test it. There's a procedure we, do, we have to do to do that. And then after we do the load test, we need to get the lo locomotive back to normal. If we didn't get the locomotive back to normal, this light would come on saying we're still in the load test. High voltage ground fault, that usually deals with, uh, you know, if you got a hole in the traction motor cable or some other, um, you know, it's basically a, another name for a short circuit. I believe it comes off at the text a little under one amp. 
circuit interrupter trip, that deals with uh, flash over in the traction motors. If you ever study lightning, you know that the air could become ionized and electricity can flow through the air. It's basically the same thing, but that's happened inside the traction motor. On the water drain, if the weather is approaching freezing, there's a detector that detects the water temperature. It's going to open a valve and drain all the water out of our engine so we don't crack the block. Over here, this is how we normally stop the engines when we're going to uh, leave. We're going to push this. It'll shut down one engine and then we'll push it. Push that one, it'll shut down the other engine. Battery charging, we're going to make sure that's in the green the, so our batteries are being charged. When we go to start this uh, locomotive, we're going to put this switch in the start. We're going to start it and then we're going to put it in the run. And then when we're all done with our work and we want to shut the locomotive down, we're going to put this back in the stop and then we're going to push this button and shut the engines down. We're also going to put it in the um, isolate. If Let's just say we're towing this locomotive dead and we don't want it to do anything. Then we'll put it in the isolate if it's trailing. And of course we've got another switch for the other engine. This is our headlight control. You know, we need this if we have, say, like four locomotives. If we didn't have this, and I turned on my rear headlight, it would just be shining on this locomotive and not the one, you know, four locomotives down. So we use that, um, you know, for our headlight control. These lights, these switches are for the lights. The platform lights are those uh, lights on the steps. We have lights in the engine room. The classification lights, those are those small white lights that you can change from a uh, green to red on the front and the rear. Number board lights, those turn on our lights their number board, which you can see are on, and they're just light bulbs. Makes it easy to change them out. Signal light, there used to be a, a rotating beacon on the roof of this locomotive, but it was removed. Dynamic brake cutout. This is pretty important. We have FRA rules that determine uh, how much dynamic brakes we could have on our train per axle. So say for instance we had eight locomotives and maybe uh, only five of them could have operating dynamic brakes. This was a sixth, seventh, or eighth locomotive. We'd turn this off so the dynamic brakes were not working. We can't open these two panels because they're wired shut, but it's just more electrical things. Now if we open this panel on the electrical cabinet. We have all of our circuit breakers over here. And you can see like the turbo auxiliary pump. We never want that shut off. When we shut off the engine, this pump has to run for 30 minutes to cool the bearings. And also for the auto water drain. You know, if, the, if we start getting the freezing temperature, we don't want this shut off because we want the block to drain so it won't crack. We normally shut off the fuel pump when we leave. That's an, another uh, safety precaution to keep people from starting the locomotive. And over here we have our main battery knife switch. This connects the battery with the main electrical system. 800 amp starting fuse. And over here we have a fuse tester. And the way this works is we put our fuse up here like this, hold it, then hit the on switch. If the fuse is good, this light will light up. And over here we got some spare fuses. So the predecessor of this locomotive is called the DD35. The DD35 is nearly identical, except it has a standard cab. Now when Union Pacific took delivery of the DD35, they looked at the electronics and they were pretty upset about it. They said, we like the locomotive, but we hate all these old electronics. Basically, they put the electronics of the F units in them. They said, with the DD40X, we want something new. We don't want all these relays and solenoids and wires. Give us something better. So the X and the DD40X stuff were experimental. Experiment was ease. Electronic control modules. This was really the first attempt to have a computer control the functions of the locomotive. This was successful. They've used the system in every MD locomotive since then. 
and they still use it today except they're much smaller and there's a lot less of them. As far as, uh, you know, giant leaps in technology, this is one of the biggest ones as far as locomotives go. These electronic control modules each control a function. Each one of these controls a different function such as sanding, a wheel slip, overspeed, dynamic braking, voltage regulation, etc. And the great thing about these was if one of these modules was defective, we could just pull it out, stick another one in there pretty quickly. We could also uh, check things with a voltage meter through these ports here. Like if we want to check our generator voltage or whatever. And that way we didn't need to even go in the back of the locomotive to check things. We could do everything right here. And looking at these modules, looks like the last time they were tested was uh, February of 84. So this locomotive is probably running up until 1984. So now we're looking at the bottom of the main electrical cabinet. We have these large switches. They're connected to our traction motor cables. You know our generator cables come in through here and then they go to the switch and then from there they go to the traction motors. And someone was nice enough to leave us notes. So this is a motor operated transfer switch, locomotive directional. So when we go from forward to reverse, the switch is either going to open or close and make us go in forward or reverse. It's rated at 1200 amps, uh, 1500 volts. Power contactor for traction, 1200 amps, 1500 volts. Generator field contactors, function is a closed contact for power monitoring or for dynamic braking. So we'd have a switch that would close when you go into dynamic braking. More switches back here. Motor operated transfer switch. Changes from power to dynamic braking, 1200 amps, 1500 volts. So when we go from throttle, we're going to go from our throttle to idle. And then we go into dynamic braking, the switch is either going to open or close. So looking at the first engine right behind the cab there, the first power plant, this is a 16 cylinder, 645 cubic inches per cylinder engine. Now I've always wondered, can we run this locomotive just on one power plant and not the other? And I talked to an engineer at the operable DD40X and he says we can. So that was a great selling point because a lot of times when you have one engine go down, you know, this whole locomotive would be out of service, but we could run this engine and this engine powers that truck under the cab. That engine powers the other truck in the rear end. Now you can see this plate here, it says 645E3, which is engine, add 40X power packs. But obviously these power packs were unique to this engine. Now looking at this engine, Unfortunately, everything's been totally gutted out of here. They left the camshaft, which is right here. The lay shaft lever, which controls the fuel injectors. And the fuel rail over here. Now first, I was a little upset about this because I can't tell you how everything works. But I'm actually kind of happy because we can really get a good view of how this engine is made. Now this may look like a, very, a dirty engine. This is actually very clean. I have seen that gunk on there several inches thick. Two, three inches thick. So this is not too bad at all. And you're actually seeing a lot of bare metal in there. And these plugs here called cylinder test ports. And these these are welded, but these would normally unscrew, and there's a hole that goes all the way to the cylinder. And the reason we have these is um, if, this if this engine sits for any length of time, there could be water accumulating in the cylinders, it could also be fuel. So before we start it, we're going to open it, every one of these up, and we're going to spin the engine around a few times. It's going to blow whatever's out there, just like cylinder cocks on a steam engine. We're going to tighten these back down, 
and start it. And also, if we're turning this engine over by hand, we can open these up and it makes it a lot easier to turn it without all that compression. And there's a special tool that goes in here and you turn it on and off like that. And also, these cylinder test ports, we got a special tool. We could take this out, we could screw it in. It's got an air hose and a gauge. We pump the cylinder full of air when it's on top dead center. We close the, the valve on it and we watch the gauge and uh, if we see a bunch of leakage that tells us that we got a, we may have a cracked piston, we have worn rings or we have worn exhaust valves. Looking in the oil pan, all the oil has been drained of course, but this oil pan holds anywhere from 243 to almost 400 gallons of oil. You can see there's a piece of the bearing in there. If you're wondering how often do we change the oil, the answer is we never change the oil. The only time we change oil is when it's time for overhaul, which is about every 10 years, or if the oil gets contaminated by something. When this locomotive has its 90 day inspection, there's people that will take samples of this oil to see if it's contaminated with anything. If the oil is good, they'll just keep adding it. Now this, a typical locomotive on this engine, if we were to go around 200 miles, this engine would probably use about five to eight gallons of oil, just burning it up. So I knew there was going to be a lot of questions with the DD40X engines because they were totally disassembled. So I thought it would be nice if I could take you to another museum where they have a locomotive with a 645 engine in there. And that way I could show you what it looks like intact and I could show you how everything works. So now we're going to take a look at the intact 645 diesel engine. So here we are taking a look at the intact 645 diesel engine. This engine is identical to the one in the DD40X. They call it the 645 because there's 645 cubic inches per cylinder. This engine weighs around, you know, fully assembled 17 tons. It can produce 3,300 horsepower. And this is widely considered one of the greatest diesel engines of all time. It's certainly one of the most successful. It was built from uh, 1965 until, I believe, 1983. This engine has been used in tens of thousands of locomotives all over the world. And not only was this a great diesel engine for locomotives, but for the marine industry, many ships use this type engine. Everything from those big merchant ships to the tugboats. Power plants um, use these both as primary and backup generators. And the mining industry uses these as pumps and the run blowers. But it is a, really a superior um, locomotive engine. So looking at this engine, it's uh, really about as basic as it gets for a diesel engine. If you're a mechanic or if you want to be a mechanic and you want to work on locomotives one day, it does not take long to learn how to repair these diesel engines. It's just so basic. So up here is the camshaft. You have an oil line going to the camshaft. There's three roller rocker arms. Over here is the bridge. We have four exhaust valves, one here, one here, and we have an extra spring. One here, one over here. Now since the injector is mechanical, we have a, a rock arm to fire the injector, and that has a spring. There's two fuel lines coming in here. There's an incoming and an outgoing fuel line. And the way this works is we have pressurized fuel going to the fuel injector, the fuel injector is going to take whatever it needs and it's going to return fuel back into the fuel reel here which goes back to the fuel tank. Now you may wonder why we need to have this kind of system and that's because the, the fuel injector is not cooled by anything. The fuel injector is actually sticking out the top of the cylinder head so it would melt if it didn't get some kind of cooling. So what they do is they run extra fuel going to the fuel injector, it takes whatever it needs and the rest is used for cooling, return back to the fuel line. Now these massive nuts and bolts here, these are called crab bolts and nuts and this is what actually keeps the cylinder heads in place. And these massive bolts, the final torque on one of these is 1800 foot-pounds. We have a, a hydraulic wrench to take them on to put them off but that final torque we do have to use a torque wrench and uh, that is a very big torque wrench uh, it's about six feet long and you usually have to have two guys to put it on there this is called the rack 
the rack goes to the governor. It's this arm here. And the rack is going to move back and forth and control the fuel output of the injector. So this is going to move back and forth. So that's like your throttle. So we call these power packs. Each one of these power packs can be removed fairly quickly. In the power pack we have the cylinder head, we have the injector, we have the valves. We have the, the cylinder itself, the pistons inside the cylinder, and the connecting rod. And we can pull this entire assembly out of here. It may look like it's welded down there, but this all comes out. It goes all the way down here. And this was actually a, a great selling point because if we have a, a bad cylinder, we don't need to take the whole engine out. We can just take out this power pack. The cylinder comes out with it. We can put a new unit in there and uh, get this button back together pretty quickly. So now we're going to move from the top deck to the air box. Now this whole assembly here, from here down to here, this is the air box. This is where the pressurized air comes in, either from the blowers or the turbocharger to go into the cylinders. This is a water pipe. This is a water that cools the engine. It has a branch off pipe that comes from here and then into the cylinder. So that's going to cool the cylinder. With a traditional uh, four-stroke engine, you have intake, compression, power, and exhaust. But this is a two-stroke, so we have intake and compression at the same time, as well as power and exhaust at the same time. Now the piston's probably about halfway up, but you know when the piston comes all the way down, those ports are going to be open, that air is going to come in there, the piston's going to come up, and then it's going to have its uh, compression and power. The valves on top are going to open the exhaust valves and then the piston's going to come back down and that air is going to come in there and start to cycle all over again. And you can see it's a little bit oily because of course you, know, you can see the, the piston there, the piston noise carries a little bit of oil with it and that oil gets in the air box and that, that's going to collect carbon. We're going to need to clean this periodically. Now we're going to go from the air box into the oil pan. And I was pretty surprised to see that there's still oil in there. And I believe this holds about 350 gallons of oil. And they actually stopped the crankshaft in a great place because we could see the bottom of the bearing there. Now, um, when I was working on these trains, God forbid you drop a, a wrench or a socket, or even worse, one of these bearings in that oil, because that goes down a few feet. And these bearings are non-magnetic, so you're in a lot of trouble if you drop a bearing in there, and they're pretty heavy. So if you do drop something in there, you're probably going to be sticking your arm in there, up into your armpit. Then we're looking at the bottom of the crankshaft. Here's the bearing. The bearing's in two pieces. There's a top half and a lower half. We call this the basket. The basket is connected to the connecting rod and the piston. And we simply remove this bolt, that bolt, and these three bolts, and the basket comes out. So if we need to replace a bearing, we can do that pretty quickly. And even the bearing that's on the top of the crankshaft, we just, we could just push it out and it'll fall out of there. This is a crankshaft cap. That's what holds the crankshaft up. There's four large bolts, you know, keeping the crankshaft in there. One over there. Another reason this engine was so successful was because unlike traditional diesel engines that were made in a foundry, you know, you would have a mold and they would um, make that mold and then they'd pour that metal. The big problem with that is if you had a rod failure, you would throw that rod through the side of the engine here and there was no way of repairing that cast iron, uh, you know, because it was shattered in a bunch of pieces, so that engine would be trashed. But we, what EMD did was they pressed and formed this locomotive in a bunch of sections, like this airbox cover right here. This was a section right here. This was a section. The oil pan was made in the section, and it was all made from steel. And that was uh, really great because, you know, if we did throw a rod here, this rod's going to come out here and damage this metal. But instead of that block being trashed, all we'd have to do is cut out that metal, and we'd have a spare block where we'd cut out that donor piece, and we could weld it back up. And even if it was damaged on the inside, we could um, fabricate metal and weld that up. 
So that was really an excellent uh, selling point for these engines. This has four oil pumps to each engine. We have a turbo oil pump, which is on the engine, and I'll show you that later. We have this oil pump called the scavenging oil pump. The purpose of this oil pump is to pump oil into the oil filters, which are in this large canister. And the lube oil cooler, that cools the oil going back into the engine. And from there, it ends up in that strainer box there. We'll get a better view of that on the other engine. That's where we add the oil. There's two oil pumps here. There's a piston oil uh, pump that pumps oil on the underside of the pistons to keep it cool. And then there's a main oil pump that pumps oil to all the critical things such as the rods, the crankshaft, the camshaft, and everything else. So another part of the system is a lube oil separator, which is right here. It has a tube going into the turbo. The exhaust is going to create a vacuum in here. That vacuum is going to suck the gases out of the crankcase anywhere else in the engine and as well as the smoke from the hot oil. It's going to go into here. There's a wire mesh. The oil is going to collect on that mesh and it's going to fall back down into the engine. So two of the most important pieces of equipment on this locomotive is the governor which is here and the load regulator which is over here. The purpose of the governor is when you advance the throttle to a certain position, it's going to keep this engine at a certain RPM. The governor could sense loads and it's going to increase or decrease the fuel going into the injectors. And it does that by moving this lever here, which is called the lay shaft lever. And normally there would be injectors in there and that would be increasing or decreasing the fuel pressure. With the lay shaft lever, we could also manually throttle the locomotive up by pushing this lever in down like that. So the governor is controlling the engine's RPM and the fuel going into the engine. It's also controlling the load regulator. And as you can see, there's not much to the load regulator. It's got this set of wires going to it and two oil lines in the back of it. But this is a very important piece of equipment. The governor can move this dial over here, which will reduce or increase the generator excitation or the output of the generator. And say for instance if the engine's starting to get bogged down and it's going way below the normal RPM, the governor could lessen the load on the generator and that would put less of a load on the engine and the engine could go back to the normal RPM. So that's what that device does. Looking over here we have a low water and crankcase pressure alarm. And you can see it's operating normally. We don't have any water, so it tripped. You see this button pushed out. This would shut down the engine, and we'd have a warning light inside the cab. Crankcase pressure, if the turbo is producing an excess amount of uh, pressure in the crankcase, this is going to pop open and shut the engine down. Looking at the cooling system, here's a water tank. It holds 300 gallons of water. Now we use water, we do not use antifreeze because antifreeze when it starts to leak it's going to contaminate the oil and it will contaminate the system. Water on the other hand, when it gets in that hot oil it's just going to evaporate and also putting 300 gallons of antifreeze in 9,000 something locomotives would cost an awful lot of money. And this water tank has a sight glass over here so we can check this locomotive when it's running. See how much water we have in there. What happens is the water comes down this tube and into this pipe. From there it goes into the water pump. There's a temperature gauge there. There's also a water pump on the other side. That water pump pumps water to the left side of the engine. This water pump pumps water to the right side of the engine. It goes through this tube and into the engine. This is a water pipe. There's usually a pipe here that goes into the engine cylinder. The water goes through the engine cylinder to the top of the cylinder head. 
and then and then from there it goes through another pipe and then back into the engine into this water manifold. Some of the water is pumped through this pipe and into the turbo after cooler. The turbo after cooler is simply like a large radiator and you can see it's not very big it's an air box and what that does is it's going to cool the air coming out of the turbo into the engine because cooler air is going to be more denser and we're going to get better combustion the water goes through the turbo after cooler into this pipe and then back into the top of the engine over there water on, on both sides of the engine comes here to this pipe called the Y pipe. You can see it branches off. The pipe then goes to the radiators which are right up here. The water goes through the radiators where it's cooled by fans. As you see, that's the left side of the radiator. This is the right side. From there, the water comes down this pipe and into the lube oil cooler, which is right here. It's the same for the other side. They both go into the lube oil cooler. The lube oil cooler cools the oil and engine. And from there, starts the process all over again. So another part of the cooling system is a water temperature manifold which is what this is. These are water temperature sensors. There's three of them. There's a fourth one that's missing. What this does is when this uh, these actuate the fans on top of the roof. So at 155 degrees this is going to send a signal back to the cab. The cab's then going to send a signal over here to the cooling fan relay cabinet and that's going to turn on the cooling fans. Now if I remember right this comes on at 155 and this is 168 and this is 177 I believe. But this would activate fan number one, this would activate fan number two, this would activate fan number three and then the one that's missing would look identical to these but at 208 degrees or just before boiling this is going to shut down the engine and we're going to get a hot engine alarm. Now these actuators over here I'm not sure but I believe these are either for the air compressor they turn on and off the air compressor or they're for the sanders. There's two of these air compressors on the locomotive this is a three piston, two stage air compressor. We have a pipe here to make it easy to drain the oil. When this is running, it sucks in air through this air filter. This large pipe goes to these two low pressure cylinders. The low pressure cylinders then pipes the air into the high pressure cylinder. The air travels through uh, a small radiator to cool it and from there the air goes in through this pipe and down into the air tank. Now this uh, compressor is running all the time. If the engine is running this air compressor is running. It takes about 22 horsepower just to run this air compressor. It's not always pumping air it's only pumping air now and then but it is always turning. So that pipe coming from the air compressor comes here and into these two large air tanks. Now since there's condensation in the air, whenever we compress air, there's going to be water that starts to collect in this air tank. And it may be hard to tell, but this tank is coming down at an angle. It's down a little bit more. So that water runs down through here and then over here to this device. Now this is set on the timer to where it automatically opens and closes this valve to let out some air along with some water. And we could also open this valve here 
to manually drain some water out of there. And because we're getting water in this tank, this tank is unpainted on the inside and it's going to rust. And that could be a problem because, you know, over the years this steel is going to get paper thin. So what they did is they drilled these small holes in here. And they go all around the tank and they're on the end of the tank too. So when this metal is paper thin, it's just going to blow through this tiny hole here because this is the weakest part of the tank, these holes. And then that's going to tell us that we need to discard this air tank and get a new one. Now something I always wondered about with this locomotive is why they have this middle section that's wide open like this. And looking at the grates, we went from this diamond plate to this grate. So it's pretty obvious that they were trying to lower the weight in the middle here. At first I thought that maybe this was just for weight reduction. But after looking at the top here, I was really amazed to see that this is just rubber. There is no metal support at all going through the top of this. And that can only mean one thing, that this metal section flexed so much that if we did have doors here, it would have crushed them. It you know, would have deformed them. So that's probably why they have this. And that's really quite surprising that this car body provides no strength at all from the top down. It's all through this frame here. So here we are at the end of the locomotive. We'll open up this uh, access door here. And you can see these massive switches for uh, energizing the traction motors, sending power to them. There's the cables to the traction motors, just massive. You would never ever open this door when this is under load because it would, a lot of amperage coming through there. And I believe those are the silicone rectifiers. Big switch gear though. Yeah, just big electrical switches for the traction motors. And that's at the very end here. So unfortunately, they lost the key to the lock for these two doors back here. But really, there's not a whole lot back there. We can see through this door. Now that's just a small walkway. You can see it's just a small walkway. Barely enough to fit. Probably two or three guys. Now if we open this little door and then the locomotive, we could see our companion generator. We couldn't see this in the other room because it was hidden. Now this is a 74 volt, about 135 amp generator. It's driven by the engine through that shaft. That shaft also powers the blower for the traction motors, which is right over there. Now this generator is going to provide electricity to the low voltage circuits such as the headlights, the heater blowers, um, the battery charging, and it's also going to give our alternator ex excitation. So here we are at the end of the locomotive looking at the second power plant. This power plant is identical to the first power plant except it's facing the opposite direction. Now I told you earlier that we have a generator which is over here that only provides electricity to the traction motors. We have an alternator which is right here which is physically connected to the generator but electrically they're separated. This is a D14 alternator. 
It's three phase, 215 volts, 450 amps. This is alternator, it provides excitation to the main generator. It also provides electricity for the radiator fans, the filter blower motor, the control circuits, and the silicone rectifiers. If we didn't have this alternator, not only would we not have generator excitation, but every time one of the fans turned on, they'd be taking electricity from the main generator and slowing their train down. And not far from the alternator is the flywheel. You'll notice that there's notches in this flywheel. There's actually a large bar that we put over here. It's shaped kind of like an L. And that bar comes in here. And we can manually turn over the engine with that bar if we need to spin this engine over manually. And we can also time it. I don't know if you can see those timing marks on there. There's a timing pointer when we go to set the fuel injectors. Now they ran into some, into some problems when they were building this engine. This was such a low RPM engine, it wasn't producing a, enough exhaust to spin the turbocharger. And it wouldn't keep running. So this has a pretty unique turbocharger. This turbocharger is equipped with a clutch pack. And at low RPMs, it's turning by gears in the engine. So I guess in, se in that sense, for my mechanical friends, it would be a supercharger because it's gear driven. After about, I believe it's notch six, that clutch pack is going to disengage and then this turbocharger is going to be run off the exhaust gases and then it will be a true turbocharger. And just like before, the high pressure air is going to go through here, through this duct, and then into this second engine here. Now looking at the second engine, at the end of the locomotive, it's just like the first engine, totally gutted and pretty much in the same condition. Pretty clean. They remove these packs and send them back to EMD for uh, rebuilt ones, like a core. Now one of the things I really like about these EMD engines is it only has two valve covers on this side. This is great because on GE engines, each, you know, the cylinder head, they each have a cover on it. On this, we just flip these latches. We could open up this valve cover and we got access to everything. And we could open this up when it's running and work on it. So that's great. They have these fold down little steps here which makes it great to work on. So we're looking at the other engine facing opposite direction. We can see the starters. There's two starters. These en both engage at the same time. Let me tell you, this is a horrible job changing out these starters. These starters each weigh 80 pounds. It's a lot of work. Now if you're wondering, let's just say this engine doesn't start, how long can we crank before our battery starts to go dead? Now in my experience, it's very similar to a car. You crank this for maybe 10 seconds, you'd wait. Maybe 30 seconds, you crank it for 10 seconds. If it wouldn't start, your battery would probably go dead after about, I'm going to say, four minutes of doing that. This pump over here, this pumps oil to our turbo. I was explaining that earlier how uh, before we start the engine, we need to pump oil to the turbo. And then after we shut the engine down, this is going to run for 35 minutes to cool the bearings. So here's one of the bearings. You know, the bearing is in two halves. There's the upper half and the lower half. And you see my hand for the size. This is one of the smaller ones. I dug this out of the oil pan. Now these bearings, when you put them in, I mean this is filthy, but if I clean this up, this must be totally smooth. If there's even the smallest scratch where I, I can catch my fingernail, we need to um, take a file and file that down. Because what will happen, that tiny little scratch, that's going to get a, a small piece of metal and it's going to go around and around. It's going to get more pieces of metal. 
and then that's going to go around and around. Eventually this whole bearing is going to get ate up, the crankshaft's going to get eaten up, and then we're in a lot of trouble. Looking at one of the sand boxes, there's 53 cubic feet of sand in there. You filled in right here. See what's in there. So here's our fuel pump. The fuel pump sucks fuel out of the fuel tank. It goes through the primary fuel filter, which is right here, and then into the secondary fuel filters, which are attached to the engine. This is normally full. If this is full, that's telling us that everything's working okay. As this fuel filter gets plugged up, it's going to start creating back pressure, and then we're going to see fuel in this one. If we start seeing fuel in this one, we need to change our fuel filters. The fuel goes from there into this fuel line, which goes to the other side and this side. And then into this fuel rail right here. Normally we'd have two lines going into the fuel injector. If you're wondering how much fuel each engine uses, it's around five gallons an hour just at idle. In full throttle, it's about 170 gallons an hour. It's a lot of fuel. So once again, we see water pump, another water pump, just like what we saw before, the governor. And except for this uh, wire going into the governor, this locomotive engine is almost entirely mechanical. We have this lever here. If the locomotive starts um, getting high RPMs, it's going to trip this lever and it's going to shut the uh, locomotive down. This is a locomotive overspeed lever. Once again, the white pipe for the cooling. This is an oil strainer box. There's two large metal strainers in there. And this is where we'd normally add oil. We remove this cover and add our oil there. We could do that while the engine is running. So earlier I was showing you the scavenging oil pump that pumps oil to the lube oil cooler, which is over here, and also to lube oil filters. There's seven filters in there. As you can see, it goes back quite a ways, probably uh, five feet maybe. We change the filters out, usually once every 90 days. Now you can never wear out oil. Oil will never become you know, less slippery through the wear. It only gets contaminated. So we never change out the oil in these engines. We just keep filtering everything. And changing these filters out is a pretty nasty job that nobody wants to do. <laughs> And once again, three cylinder air compressor, two stage, low pressure and the high pressure. Intake for the air compressor with the filter. Cooling fan contactor cabinet. Remember how I told you that water temperature sensor manifold, how those sensors pick up the water temperature? It's going to send a signal here. And this is, is what's going to turn on the cooling fans. There's little switches in here. So here's the rear of the locomotive. When we have one or more locomotives behind us, we have to hook up these three air brake hoses. And there's three air brake hoses on the other side as well. We only need to hook up one side. This air brake hose is for the application and release of the locomotive air brakes. This air brake hose will temporarily release the air brakes on the locomotive, also known as bail off. And this air hose connects the locomotive air tanks together so you have more air. And looking at this coupler, you can tell that they put a lot of miles on this. Look at how much room that is. Look at the pin. It's 
fully wore out. And of course that's the main air hose for the air for the rest of our train. Controls the braking. Now these couplers may look like solid pieces of steel, but they're uh, actually hollow inside. And these weigh about 800 pounds. Now if you want to get this out of here, there's a little keeper right there. You put some, uh, you lift that pin up, remove that keeper and that massive pin would drop out of there. And then you can pull this whole coupler out of there. That pin is extremely heavy. Uh, that is very difficult to get back in there. Now you guys are probably wondering, we have these free arrows hooked up uh, with two locomotives. Can we disconnect the locomotives without disconnecting the air hoses? And yeah, you can, but it's not a, a good idea. I've never had any problem with this one or this one, but this one, I've seen this thing get stuck when you're pulling them apart and these things stretch maybe five feet and when they come apart, they go right in the ditch light. This one doesn't have ditch light. If you're wondering how we disconnect it with air pressure in there, you come over here and there's valves. And these, there's a little hole in here. You can't see it, it's probably on the bottom. But when you close this, the air goes through the hole and releases it. So this is closed, closed all three of them. And we just come over here. There'd be no more air. We could just disconnect them. And then this big one, this is called the angle cock. This is your main air for your train. So that would be closed. So we close that before we um, uncouple the car. So the locomotive doesn't go in the emergency. Now I showed you earlier in this electrical cabinet, those huge um, traction motor cables. Now here's where they come out. And just look at how big these things are, just huge. See, they come down here, down there, and then they go into the traction motors. The traction motor, of course, is electric motor that powers the wheel. There's a gear coming off that traction motor. On the axle of the wheel is another gear, and that's how the motor turns the wheel. There's four cables going in there. Two are positive, two are negative. There's a blower duct right there. That's where the cold air comes in to cool off the traction motor. The motor with the wheel and the axle and the pinion weighs about four and a half tons. Uh, this motor is rated about 1120 amps. If we go anything over that, we could end up burning up the cables or the motor. And if we were to take this motor out of the locomotive and just power like a, say a large industrial fan or a pump, it would uh, be rated about 600 horsepower. We'll look at the other motor over here. And these are DC motors. If we have locomotives behind us, the way we control them is through a cable connected right here. And I have some paperwork telling what each one of these pins do. And I don't know if you can see or not, but there's numbers on there. But number one is power reduction. Two is alarm bell. Three is D governor solenoid. Four is negative voltage common. Five is emergency sand. Six is generator field. Seven is C governor solenoid. Eight is reverse. Nine is forward. Ten is wheel slip indicator. Eleven is spare. Twelve is B governor solenoid. 13 control circuits and fuel pump. 14 is a spare. 15 is a governor solenoid. 16 is an engine run. 17 is dynamic brake control. 18 and 19 are spares. 20 is dynamic brake warning. 21 is dynamic brake interlock. 22 is air compressor control. 23 is manual sand. 24 is dynamic brake excitation. 25 is a headlight, 26 is ground relay reset, and 27 is a spare. This is pretty neat. This is something you don't see too often. If you got rails that's not worn too much and you got good wheels, you can see the surface area that the wheel is actually riding on. And you can tell 
a lot of people say it's about the surface of a dime. And that's just what it is. That is the contact of the wheel on the rail. When you got good wheels and good rail. Now this is pretty neat. This is something you don't see too often. This is known as a car track. And it looks like a big barcode, that's exactly what it is. Back in the late 60s, uh, this guy developed a system where they'd have a large scanner on the track. And they would scan this barcode, and then that tell you the number of the car and who owns the car. And eventually this became mandatory on all railroads, so just about every locomotive and rail car had this. The problem with this is, you can tell it's pretty big. You know, these cars would get spray painted over with graffiti. These uh, stickers would get ripped off, and then the rain and snow, they couldn't read it too good. So this was eventually abandoned, but early uh, barcoding system, pretty good. It worked for a while. There's the dynamic brake grids. If you put enough electricity to those, those will glow red hot. And there's dynamic brake grids up there as well. So if we want to jack up this locomotive, we have four jacking pads. Well, here's one of them. We place a jack under there, and that would lift this entire locomotive off of the trucks. We could also pick this up with a crane over here. And as you can see by the wear, it's been picked up many, many times. There's a plate here. We could remove this plate to put the cables up through there. So looking at the locomotive truck, this is made from cast steel. It's not made from cast iron. Cast iron is difficult to work with. We can't cut it with a cutting torch. It's um, hard to weld and it, it cracks pretty easy. Cast steel on the other hand, it's very forgiving. It will bend. We can weld on it with no problem. We can cut on it with no problem. And if we develop a crack, it usually takes quite a while before it goes all the way through. This locomotive, of course, rides on roller bearings made by the Hyatt Company. You can see that they safety wired these bolts to keep them from coming out. Now, this is a wet type of bearing. By the core of the bearing is submerged in oil. You put the oil in here. Now EMD discontinued this type of bearing, I believe, with the SD70 in the early 1990s. After that, they, um, they used the type of bearings like you see in the freight cars, which are just um, grease pack bearings. Now without even knowing anything about this locomotive, I can just look at this gap over here and tell that this is a high mileage locomotive. You know, when this locomotive is new, the gap between the frame and the, the journal here is only about this wide. But the constant up and down motion and the constant back and forth motion, it wears away this metal over here, as well as alongside the frame, even though we got this pedestal liner here, that constant hammering is to remove a metal. And you know, as that metal gets removed, we put in these plastic pedestal liners to fill up the gap. And I can tell just by looking at the gap over here, and especially this gap, I mean, it's just huge. It's probably over an inch. That's probably about the maximum amount of gap allowed before we need to start welding up the frame and welding up these journals again. And that's really not a big deal, but when you look at the time involved of doing something like that, welding up the frames, putting in new journal boxes, you're probably talking at least a month, uh, you know, with the machine work and everything. And, you know, you could do the math. If you've got 60 of these locomotives, it's going to take you years just to do these frames. So that's probably one of the reasons that locomotives like this get retired. 
this large bar is removable. This bar serves two functions. The first function is to um, provide strength for the truck. Just recently I learned that if you remove this bar and you remove the other bar, uh, this frame will actually bend down due to the weight and crack. So we can only do one at a time. When we jack up the locomotive, it keeps the wheels from falling off. So looking at this truck, if we're going in this direction all the time, we're going to wear this wheel out much faster than any of these three wheels. And if we're going in this, if we're going in this direction most of the time, we're going to wear this wheel out quicker because it's the lead wheels that's going into the curves. So you'll notice that this wheel and this wheel will have quite a bit of wear, whereas these two wheels in the middle won't. And some railroads even switch wheels to, you know, to be the leading wheel because they're going to wear out quicker. This tube coming down is for the engine water drain. We drain the water out of the engine, it'll just come out there right on the ground. Now if you look over here, there's a massive chain attached to the truck. This has been going on since the steam engine days. You know, these locomotives were rated for 90 miles an hour. And if this thing goes, you know, flips over a curve or is a runaway or gets in an accident, we don't want this truck to go flying through the air and through somebody's house. Because this truck weighs 40 tons. So they have these big chains to keep it attached to the locomotive in case we wreck. And also, if we we're going to jack the locomotive up, the truck stays with it. Because we don't want that massive kingpin in there to come out. And here's the air cylinder. You can see the air only comes in one way. There's a piston in there that pushes this lever that pushes the brakes on. Now when I was working for the railroad, this piston could only come out about four inches. And after four inches, we had to um, adjust the brakes. We had a little tape measure and we measure it. And adjust the brakes down here. You just come down here. You release the brakes like they are now and uh, take this cotter key out, remove this bolt, and then move it in one of these holes here. And then that moves this brake shoe closer. And uh, removing the brake shoe is actually really easy. You know, that one's not a good, let me show you this one down here. Yeah, to remove a brake shoe, all you do is you pull this lever out of here you see, pull this piece of steel out of here and just pull the and then just pull the brake right out. And then you push the new brake in and you push the steel back down there and that's it. Piece of cake. And you can see changing the, uh, adjusting the brakes over here. Just move this over here, pull the pin out, then uh, adjust that, put the pin in one of those holes. And over here is a sand tube which if you follow it goes over to this massive sandbox it's filled with sand all locomotives need sand for traction especially when you're starting and uh, going up grades and when it's rainy when it's raining out and I'll tell you the last thing you ever want to do is get that sand wet if that sand gets wet, it's going to clump. And it's going to get stuck right in here. This is the device that turns on the sand. You can see it's got an airline coming through here. And the, the sand drops through here and goes through the tube. Now this thing gets plugged. We close the valve here. This is made to be taken off. You can unscrew that. You pull that off and you get a wire in there and you get the sand out. It's a hell of a mess. It really sucks if those things get plugged up. Now this fuel tank is the largest fuel tank ever put on a locomotive. I believe it weighs 30 tons when it's full. 8,200 gallons. Now I worked for a hostler for a little while at the Union Pacific and I can tell you that these gauges never worked. They were always broken, always inaccurate, which is why you have this over here. The sight glass, just like the steam engines. 
and I'll tell you, 7400, 7900, full. So these are very accurate. And we only want to fill up to right here with fuel. No more than that, because diesel expands and diesel will start to overflow. So you can see it's got two fuel fillers over here. And I talked to Ed, he's a sometimes an engineer of the operable DD40X, and I asked him, I said, is this one tank or two tanks? He says it's one tank. And uh, when I used to fuel locomotives, it would take me about um, 20 minutes to put in 3,000 gallons. So this is 8,200 gallons. So yeah, that could take almost an hour just to fill this up. So imagine they had two so you could fuel it at the same time. Some of you are probably wondering if I'm refueling the locomotive and I got the fuel nozzle in here and I click it open and I just walk away and this locomotive fills up with fuel, what's going to happen? And uh, I've seen all kinds of things happen. I've seen it where the fuel nozzle actually shuts off just like a car, but more often than not, the fuel will go up through the vent tube and then it'll just run out. Usually, um, usually you'll see a pipe out here and the fuel will just run out the pipe onto the ground. But one time I actually saw where the vent, the vent tube was plugged up and the fuel nozzle was in here filling up and that fuel was just spraying everywhere like a like one of those New York City fire hydrants that you see in the summertime. It was spraying all over the locomotive, the fuel tank, everywhere is a huge mess. And no, I wasn't filling that one up as somebody else. They do make these out of cast aluminum in case we forget to take the fuel nozzle off and drive away with it. That way I'll just rip this off and not the pipe. Over here we have um, air filters. This is a primary air filter and this is a secondary air filter. So now towards the front of the locomotive, we have these three boxes here. I'm not going to open up these three boxes. This one would have the battery inside of it. There's a massive battery and you can always tell because it's vented. And if you look at the bottom, it's got a grate. The batteries of course long gone. And locomotive batteries can last for as long as 20 years. If we were to open up this panel, there'd be a maze of air brake piping in there. And I'm not going to open that door because that door is very heavy and I need a ladder to close it again. We have the bell. And this bell is really in a bad place because we're going to be riding right here if we're giving hand signals to our engineer. And the last thing we need is this loud bell ringing inches from our head. And I'm sure the engineer probably don't like to hear it either. So a much better place for this bell probably would have been down by the fuel tank or at least moving it to the other side. This cable, that's our handbrake cable. Pretty unique, I've never seen a handbrake with a cable before, and normally it's chains. And as you can see, the piston is extended. With the brake piston extended, that means our brakes are on. If we have a derailment, this large hunk of steel here is supposed to help us um, get the wheels back on track. I've uh, used these many times, and with my experience, they're almost totally worthless and never work. And I'm not sure how heavy this is, probably about 120 pounds. But the best way to get a wheel back on the track is uh, rocks and wood. The cab is this light. And a lot of people never guess what this light is for. They still use this on today's locomotives. It's not an inspection light because there's no lights on the rear truck and there's also no light on the conductor side. This light is here to shine light on the ground at night so the engineer could actually tell if this locomotive is moving or not. Because very often it's very difficult to tell this locomotive is moving, especially if you're in a tunnel with concrete sides or if it's raining out, if it's very dark out. Because, you know, when you put it in notch one or notch two, the engine's revving up, the engine's shaking, the locomotive's shaking, but you really don't know if you're moving. And I know a lot of people are going to say, well, why don't you just look at the speedometer? 
well the first two or three or four miles per hour doesn't really show up on the speedometer. So if the locomotive is shaking and you're in throttle, you may think you're moving, but you're actually not. And you may be um, just sitting there spinning your wheels. So with this light, you look down and actually see the ground moving. And we see the sanding tube again. It goes up to those uh, sandboxes and the nose. Looks like it has all of its traction motors. Not a lot to talk about in the front of the locomotive. We have these plates here where we can adjust the plow height because we have to have so many inches between the rail and the, you know, the top of the top of the snow plow. I forget what it is. I definitely prefer the nose door lights compared to the other one, just because when it rains. Uh, you don't get the glare coming off the hood of the locomotive. Up front here, they have this valve. This is how you drain the toilet. You hook up a hose to it and just grab the, the toilet would drain. And here we are in the rear of the locomotive, looking at the other generator room. And just like before, you have the generator, the engine, the air intake with the filters. Traction motor blower. The filter for the electrical cabinet over here. Nursery air filters. Looking inside the electrical cabinet. And then this rear engine, the rear power plant, it has uh, you know, the warning lights, battery charging, start stop, isolate, dynamic brake cutout, just like in the cab. So let's talk about dynamic braking for a minute. Normally we're applying electricity to our electric motors and they're powering the train. When we're going downhill, we're not applying any electricity. And we could turn these electric motors into generators, just like a wind turbine. So that's what dynamic braking is. We're going to put the power from the motors, you know, now they're generators, back through the same traction motor cables. Those cables are going to go through the switch gear in the electrical cabinet. And they're going to go up here into the dynamic brake grid. And just like, you know, the burners on the stove, this is going to get hot. There's a fan on top to cool it down. And we could, and from our amp gauge in the cab, we only put about 800 amps in there, which is more than enough. I don't know if you can see them in there. They're just small pieces of folded metal. And there's a fan on there that cools them off. They're not as big as what you would think they are. So talking about wheels, these are 40 inch wheels. They're hardened, but they're not hardened as hard as a railroad track. 
and we wouldn't want that. If these wheels were, say, harder than the railroad track, we're going to wear out the railroad track quicker than the wheels. And it's more expensive to replace the railroad track than the wheels. So the wheels are always less hard than the rails are riding on.